It's hard to imagine how in the midst of this apparently inhospitable tropical forest, one of the most glorious Mayan cities could set down roots and become the capital of a powerful kingdom. Slowly, little villages of just a few houses grew into a real city. It was a modest one at first, until the first monumental buildings began to appear. The North Acropolis is Tikal's most ancient complex of monuments. Built in 750 BC, it served as a royal necropolis, the resting place of chiefs and kings. Around its base, the North Acropolis measures 330 feet by 260. That is nearly 10,000 square yards, and it was over 130 feet high. The North Acropolis starts as a complex of several pyramids, each with a temple at its summit, which soon give way to more. Most astonishingly of all, these monuments were built solely by human hands, with only the simplest of tools. The Mayans used neither wheels nor pulleys, and no metal tools or beasts of burden, nothing but tools of stone. Like the whole of the Yucatan Peninsula, the subsoil of Tikal is a vast limestone base. And this brings with it the great advantage of actually having the raw material for building very close at hand. They knew what stones to use, especially in the lowlands. If you hit limestone with a volcanic stone, then obviously that volcanic stone will be able to break the limestone. People are always saying they didn't have the wheel, they didn't have metal. Very important. If you're in the plains of Mesopotamia, it's great for chariots, but if you walk in the jungle, you would see that it's useless. And roads, in the, in the tropical forests are very, very hard to maintain. So they didn't need those. At the top of each pyramid, there is usually a temple dedicated to worship. But underneath it, inside the pyramids, are royal tombs. These pyramid temples are funerary monuments that contain the graves of members of the dynasties that succeed each other at the head of the city. In the universe of the Mayans, ancestor worship is very important, and the ruler who held rituals in the presence of royal tombs legitimized his authority over his subjects. The king was the sacred intermediary between the earth and the supernatural forces. And the stele visible to all at the feet of the pyramids bear witness to this. They are over seven feet high, and they tell us about the lives of the kings of Tikal. Engraved on them are all the major episodes of their reigns, their victories, marriages, and deaths. How exactly, though, do these stele come to be standing here in the sacred space? First, the Mayans cut limestone blocks from the local quarries. They cut trenches into the rock with their flint axes to outline the shapes. Then they dug along under each block to free it. This stele is 10 feet long by more than 3 feet wide and almost one and a half feet thick. It must have weighed more than one ton. It was only once in place that the stele were carved using flint shears and wooden mallets. The orientation of the pyramids is aligned with the cardinal directions. The north corresponds to the sky, the south to the underworld, the land of the dead. The east to the rising sun, to life and rebirth, and the west to the gates of death. So the sun and its progress as they watched it across the heavens was incredibly important to them. These pyramid temples where their rituals were performed are characteristic of the Mayans' monumental architecture. 
Each pyramid temple is like a kind of miniature mountain, and the mountain is what connects you to the sky, of course. While any other kind of cave or hole in the ground is what connects you to the underworld. The cities and their kings will vie to erect the most spectacular temples. In other words, the ones that will most impress their people. The pyramids were part of the, of the theater. King's role was central. And so that theater, of which we now have only the stages, was absolutely critical, and he was the star. These monumental edifices took a huge number of workers to build them. So how, with their very basic tools, did the Mayans manage to build such gigantic structures? If you're a divine king, and you have 150,000 people you know, worshiping you, it's not hard to say, hey, you, spend the next month carving this line. Secret of all of it is labor. I think society has always been amazed to see these huge and magnificent buildings, given the technology used by the Mayans. It's truly an extraordinary achievement, but clearly, despite their lack of knowledge of metallurgy, their stone instruments, their tools, their technology, and their techniques were effective enough to achieve constructions of such complexity, and not just the complexity of the construction, but also the beauty of these buildings. From a platform on a large rectangular base were built compartments of rough cut stones. They were held together by a mortar made of sand, clay, and lime. Then these compartments were filled with a ballast of large pebbles, rubble, and earth, which gave the construction its great stability. And that's how they managed it, by knowing the hardness of the stones and how to cut them and shape them, all the techniques that allowed them to develop the architecture that amazes us all to this day. The bases of Tikal's pyramids are all filled with hundreds of thousands of stones. Everything seems full, heavy, massive. The same process was repeated at each level of the pyramid, sometimes leaving a single empty space in the middle to serve as a burial chamber. The pyramids all bear witness to the power of the kings, but the ones at Tikal are special because of their great height. From 130 to 213 feet high, they're almost as tall as the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Every king wanted to leave his mark, but how could they keep outdoing their predecessors? There was a previous pyramid, and they built another one. And many of these pyramids are like you know, the Russian dolls. But uh, this is a, it's just an internal structure. I mean, you're talking about millions of tons of weight. All around us, all the sculptures, all the buildings, and all the pavements of the city center are made of limestone. Easy to extract and sculpt, but fragile. How is it then that constructions of such a porous stone have survived through the centuries? The solution the Mayans came up with was to cover them in a thick protective coating, stucco. The advantage of stuccoing was twofold. First of all, you can paint much more easily on stucco than on stone. And secondly, it helps to prevent erosion of the stones. This protective coating, simple to carve and model, was an easy surface to paint decorative ornamentation on. So how did they make stucco? They took the limestone so readily available in the ground around them and started by breaking it into little bits. A pit filled with wood was covered with limestone and then burned at 1,000 degrees for several days to obtain fragments of quicklime. This lime was mixed with water before being mixed with very fine sand, thus producing a stucco paste.
Stucco was not difficult to make, but getting quicklime from those little pieces of limestone called for large quantities of wood to burn. 150-foot trees that they had to cut down with simple hatchets made of stone. Only a strong ruler was able to mobilize the necessary manpower. Attracting new populations was a part of the history of the classic Mayans and a central objective of all their rulers. Because when you attract people, you're attracting a workforce. And this workforce is very useful. It will pay tributes to you, and at the same time, it can build. By the beginning of our era, there were around 10 Mayan cities all competing with each other. And Tikal was determined to stand out. These pyramids are a center of power, and one that provides a fine spectacle. To sort of think of it as a stage, but also as a complex, doesn't make any sense to the individual pieces. You put them together and it's pretty impressive. These pyramids form a ceremonial center, an urban nucleus where all the inhabitants gathered on the occasion of the great rituals that bound the community to its sovereign. We know that they would go down those great stairways with their hands bleeding because they had done genital bloodletting up above, and they would go down these huge stairways. The people would gather in the squares at the foot of the pyramids to witness these rites and hear the sovereign's predictions. But the Mayan population was mainly agricultural, and it was a scattered one. How did they know when to meet up in the city center? They saw it in the stars. The Mayans have a cyclical conception of time based on the observation of the stars. They believe that the past, the present, and the future are all linked, and that only rituals intended to satisfy the gods on specific dates can predict the future. So astronomy has become the basis for divinatory calendars, which define the dates of these rituals that are obligatory to attend. In fact, the Mayans had several calendars. They basically had a 365-day solar calendar. They also had a ritual calendar that was not directly related to the sun, since it was composed of 260 days. And they had to combine these two calendars. But to achieve the precision of these calendars of theirs, the Mayans must have had an amazing knowledge of astronomy. The Mayans were passionate about astronomy, and they very early on had a sacred center for the study of the paths of the stars, a mythical group of monumental pyramids known as the Lost World. This group, located southwest of the North Acropolis, is the second nucleus of the ancient city. Most intriguingly, at the center of the group stands a pyramid 100 feet tall with sides 250 feet long at their base. It was originally decorated with stucco masks of jaguars in pairs and shows traces of color mostly red. Red is the color of the east and of the sunrise. It celebrates the birth of the sun and of life itself. Most of these temples were painted really bright red, so they were very impressive. Mayan buildings were actually brightly colored. The color palette is immense. We know about it today thanks to fragments of stucco recovered from several sites. We know that there were not only red and black, but also purple, pink, ochre, greens, and blues. The reason we think of them as red and black is because those are the pigments that are best preserved. 
This pyramid in the lost world with four staircases has, strangely, no temple at the top. Why could this be? It is, in fact, a platform for observing the stars, in particular, the sun. To the east, it faces three small constructions that are linked together and aligned north-south. You could see the sunrise from here. The sun in the left corner of the north building indicated the summer solstice, June the 21st. It rose behind the middle one at the spring and autumn equinoxes. And it rose at the right corner of the one to the south at the winter solstice, the 21st of December. The course of the sun, of the moon, of Venus, the Mayan priests observed them all. These observations made it possible to define the best dates for sowing or harvesting. What perhaps defines the Mayans more than anything else is that they increasingly associated their astronomical observations with arithmetic, since they were also mathematicians. They even made predictions. We know, for example, that they predicted eclipses of all kinds thousands of years ahead. And remember that this was all just with the naked eye, because they had no optical devices, and using architectural elements like the lost world that are markers of solstices and equinoxes.